So <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, Key Biodiversity Areas in Alberta kickoff meeting. Um, we're really excited to, to introduce things uh, to everybody here or, or reintroduce you if you've already encountered the KBA program before. My name is Peter Chaurier. I'm the KBA Canada Assessment and Outreach Coordinator from at uh, Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Uh, I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Um, just to get over a few quick housekeeping items before we get to the uh, stars of our show today. Um, I am uh, coming from Ottawa, speaking from traditional unceded Algonquin territory. Um, I, I'd recommend you to type in where you're from, uh, whose land you live on and recreate on in the chat uh, if you'd like. Um, we'll be recording the talk today for, for those who couldn't make it and for you to watch again if you'd like afterwards. Uh, we'll send a recording uh, of the talk and a link after the webinar to everybody who's registered to the Eventbrite. Um, but if you'd like a copy as well, just email me, p shorie, p s o r o i e at wcs.org. Um, if you don't want to appear on the recording, don't unmute yourself or turn on your video at the end of the talk. Um, and once we get to the question period, uh, you'll be able to ask your questions in person if you'd like. Uh, until then, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, our first presenter will be Dr. Kira Rudsep Hearn, the Director of Canada of the Canadian Key Biodiversity Areas Program at WCS Canada. Uh, Kira, I'll let you share your screen and take it away. Thanks very much, Peter. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, thanks for the great introduction, Peter. And I'm going to spend just 10 minutes giving you a brief overview of the Key Biodiversity Area Initiative in Canada. I think some of you have heard of this before. We've been up and running for a number of years, but we're just slowly working our way across the country. Um, there's uh, a lot of resources that are required to be able to do this work. We rely very much on uh, regional initiatives within this larger national initiative. So we fundraise to hire um, regional coordinators uh, who you'll hear from today. And we were just lucky enough to be able to hire a wonderful regional coordinator in for Alberta and Saskatchewan um, in the fall of this year. So we're really just getting going in Alberta and we're really excited about the work. There's tons to be done there and we hope to be as open and participatory as possible. So we want to make sure that everyone is aware of the program and has the opportunity to ask us about it and to participate um, as, as they are interested. So key biodiversity areas are something really specific. Um, they aren't just areas of importance for biodiversity uh, writ large. They are identified, they're defined by a global standard uh, and a very long set of guidelines on how to apply this global standard, which um, comprises five criteria and a number of sub criteria. So the, the overall definition of key biodiversity areas are their sites that contribute significantly to the persistence of biodiversity. So there's a couple of things to note there. It's very much a site scaled approach to conservation. Um, so it, it doesn't work necessarily for biodiversity elements that require large landscape uh, scale interventions or systemic um, approaches to conservation. Um, but it, but at the, the scale of the site has been shown to be very effective in conservation. A lot of stewardship can occur there. You can protect uh, sites. You can, uh, you, but you don't need to protect them formally. There's all sorts of different ways through land use planning that you can steward sites. So this is this is the approach that we're taking. We don't. Uh, we should. Um, make sure that everyone understands that we don't believe that this is the only tool that should be used out there. It needs to be used in a complementary fashion to tools that are already in use in most of the provinces and territories. Um, it doesn't capture, as I said, large landscape scale um, processes in all cases, although there are some criteria, and we'll talk about those in a minute too, that do capture that. Um, but uh, we need to take key biodiversity areas into account in conjunction with looking at um, landscape connectivity, ecosystem services, uh, biocultural uh, values, um, our relationships to the land, etc. So the key biodiversity areas themselves were identifying both for species and for ecosystems, and it's it's quite slow work because the work involves trying to figure out well what are the biodiversity elements that can even qualify um, for triggering a key biodiversity area. And that can occur under five different criteria, as I mentioned before. So criterion A 
uh, is threatened biodiversity and and there's two sub criteria. So we, that includes threatened species and threatened ecosystems. And the way it works is that if you have a species in a certain category of threat, for example, it's you know Kosiwik endangered or it's red list um, critically endangered, that that level of threat corresponds to a particular uh, proportion of the global or national population of the species that has to be present at the site to be to trigger a key biodiversity area. And that's often about you know one percent under criterion A of the species population that needs to be present at the site. So there, it's not that easy to trigger a key biodiversity area. We're not going to plaster them across the country, across the map, but they really represent remarkable areas that contribute in a disproportionate way to the persistence of these species and these ecosystems. Criterion B is not does, doesn't include threatened species or ecosystems. It's geographically restricted species and or ecosystems. Sometimes that overlaps with threatened um, biodiversity. Uh, but basically you're looking for species that are clumped in space so that one site is again disproportionately important to the persistence of that species. So Beringian species are a good example. In Yukon we were able to identify quite a few key biodiversity areas for species that are only found in a couple of patches, these rare plants, and we'll find some in all provinces and territories. Criterion C is um, a criterion that that identifies site, very large sites with the highest ecological integrity. So these are sites that pushes the limits of what we might consider a site. They're sites that are supposed to be about 10,000 square kilometers at least, and that they, they can um, capture process, natural processes such as you know, fire regimes, um, migrations, etc. We'll find those only in the north. Uh, our ecosystem criteria coordinator will, might mention those in a minute. Criterion D are sites that are important for um, species during particular life cycle moments. So caribou calving grounds, for example, or migratory staging sites. Uh, it's, it's, it's areas where species gather in enormous quantities at particular times of the year or during particular stages of their life. Criterion E we're not really looking at because the that's it's less developed and it's less tested, but we do have a couple of people in Canada who are testing it out to see if Criterion E, which is um, similar to most irreplaceability analyses, can capture additional biodiversity values, but so far it seems to capture most of the same sites that are already captured by other criteria. So I, I gave you an example of the thresholds under criterion A1. If a species is crit critically endangered, you need 0.5% of the global population to be present at the site to qualify it as a KBA. Um, another example is criterion B, where the species is not threatened and you need 10% of the species population to be present at the site to trigger um, the KBA. And then there's there's different criteria that we won't get into for each of the different, uh, uh, different th thresholds associated with the different criteria. So all of this is laid out in the global standard for the identification of key biodiversity areas. And then what we have in Canada also, we've developed a, a very conservative adaptation um, and uh, of, of the standard to be used at the national scale. So we use the national standard and the global standard in parallel, that one does not replace the other. And the national standard was developed because we wanted to make sure that all of the biodiversity elements that are conservation priorities in Canada were captured and they weren't all captured by the global standard. One simple example is that the global standard only um, treats full species so you can only identify a key biodiversity area for full species. So if you wanted to identify a key biodiversity area for caribou, you'd have to consider all barren ground and woodland caribou and reindeer as one species and have 1% of that entire global population present at a site uh, to trigger a key biodiversity area. The national standard uh, allows for the application of the criteria to infraspecies um, and populations. So you can have, you can look at you know, the porcupine caribou herd as one conservation unit. And we mostly take the advice of Kosiwik on what is considered um, a, a conservation unit or a population unit. Um, so we look, at, we, we rely quite a lot on designatable units. So why are we doing this work at all? We all know that Canadian biodiversity is in decline as it is in most parts of the world. Key drivers include habitat loss and, and disturbance. And of course, there's all sorts of global change that are being added on top of that. Um, 
keyboard ever series were brought to Canada. They're a relatively new tool. The tool itself, the standard was uh, published only in 2016. There were a number of Canadians who participated over 12 years in the development and testing of the keyboard ever series standard. And a number of stakeholders, uh, NGOs and governments in Canada said that this, this looks like a really good tool because it, it brings all biodiversity elements or most species and ecosystems under one umbrella. So previously there was important bird, bird and biodiversity areas, which still exists in Canada and is very important and a fundamental base to the work that we're doing now, but also important plant areas, prime butterfly areas, and a whole range of other approaches as well. And so the KBAs brings a lot of these things together and it's fully quantitative. So it doesn't matter who's doing the work, there's no negotiation, there's no qualitative input, which can be a strength or a weakness, but in this case, a lot of people see it as a strength because it doesn't matter who does the work, a site either meets the threshold or it doesn't for specific biodiversity elements. And so uh, you don't have to know the details of, you know, each how to apply different things to different in different places. You can just trust that this that the same approach is being applied to all the key biodiversity areas for all the species, all the ecosystems, um, and then you have an output that is trust trusted. So the pathway to Canada Target One um, process, which included the federal government and provincial and territorial governments, called on the provinces and territories to identify all key biodiversity areas for Canada. Feeds into their um, uh, sort of the work to prioritize sort of different places for biodiversity, but also accounting of how how effective our protected areas are and try to figure out to make sure that we're stewarding the right places in Canada. And I realize I'm running out of time. I will try to end up pretty quickly. So it's a, it's a, a few things that I just wanted to uh, emphasize. It's an information layer. There's no prescribed management that comes along with this. There's no impact on access to land. People within different jurisdictions can use this information as they see fit. I mentioned it's not negotiated. Our process is regionally focused. Um, we believe that people within provinces and territories and even in smaller regions know most about what's happening on the landscape, what's the existing conservation measures and priorities and tools being used, and what the biodiversity is like and what the how the data should be interpreted. So we really rely on experts to weigh into this process. And so far across the country, we've had hundreds of experts weighing in, and that's um, leading to very high quality outputs. All the information will be available, all the KBA boundaries and associated information will be available freely to everyone through a website that's being developed by Birds Canada um, in collaboration with us at WCS Canada and NatureServe Canada. Um, and, and yeah, so I, so I think it's a very a positive thing. It, it does two things. It, it shows us where our priorities should lie, but it also draws attention to places where there has been great success and biodiversity is still existing despite all odds even in, in rare pockets of, of biodiversity. I won't be able to get into this now because I really need to move on to the next speaker, um, but we have quite a, lar a large structure. There's, there's a huge involvement from almost all of the national Canadian NGOs, from all of the governments. There's lots of support. The conservation data centres have been incredibly supportive. We're making sure that we consult with as many people as possible for an for example, to make sure that we don't release sensitive data and locations of sensitive species. Um, and so, so we don't move forward without getting advice from within provinces and territories. We have about 250 new sites and 450 reassessed sites. So Birds Canada is leading the work to reassess all of the important bird and biodiversity areas and see whether they meet KBA criteria. The majority will, and we're not getting rid of any of the IBA sites also. They're very important sites and there's a lot of stewards on the ground uh, working in those areas. We'll hear a little bit about that in a minute. The work is incomplete. So if you see gaps on the map, it's because we haven't gotten there yet and we haven't applied all of the different criteria. The ecosystem criteria, for example, is much more difficult to apply um, and it'll take a number of years yet to get to the end of our list, but we need your help to, to identify all of these places. Um, I'm not going to go into the process, but you can get involved at any stage. We have a, a survey that we sent out in the invitation that we can post the link into the um, chat here and it would be great if you're interested in participating offering data, advice, ideas for KBAs after listening to our work today, uh, please do get in touch. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, we will move on to the next speaker.
Thank you very much, Kira. Um, the uh, the survey that Kira mentioned is has just been dropped in the chat, um, so please do fill this out um, now or uh, at the end of the webinar uh, if you're interested in, in learning more and participating in the KBA process. Um, I'll turn it over now to Michael if you want to share your screen. Um, Michael is the Key Biodiversity Area Regional Coordinator for Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, and he'll talk a little bit about the work he's done so far. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Kira and Peter. Um, can everyone see my screen? Looks good. Okay. Um, so conveniently enough, my first slide is the last one um, Kira, from Kira's presentation, essentially, um, which I won't go into too much detail, but this is essentially the, the flow of the process, which is to identify these trigger species that may meet the various KBA criteria, and then we start looking for areas where they might be contributing to triggering a KBA at that site and then proceed through evaluating them against those criteria and then delineating them and reviewing them with basically expert input, which is super important. Um, <clears throat> Kira mentioned that there are five different criteria. Um, I substantially work with the first two here, which is uh, criterion A is to do with threatened diversity and criterion B is geographically restricted diversity. And just uh, one of my favorite lichens on the right hand side, which won't trigger any KBAs, but... Um, this is an example. So I'm basically going to go through a few examples of trigger species that will act in Alberta and then a few areas that they may enter into KBAs. Um, so this is an example of one that will be a trigger species in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, this is called the desert rock scab lichen or Glyphalichia scabra. Um, it's a globally vulnerable, or sorry, that should be globally um, imperiled species and nationally imperiled species. Um, a desert lichen species that grows on these really interesting um, sort of calcareous conglomerate or calcareous sand, sandstone oak crops and mostly in the Cypress Hills area. So the vast majority actually of the Canadian population is in the Cypress Hills. So that makes this a pretty clear uh, KBA trigger species in that area, for example. And um, yeah, so that's in this case, we're referring to this being because of its rarity, it's going to be a trigger species under that criterion A. Um, A1 just means that it's a, acting, a, it's a species specific rather than ecosystem specific rarity uh, criterion. And then the threshold that we need to meet is in the table of, of standards like the, you know, you can look up for each, uh, depending on the rarity of the species or the ecosystem, you can look up what those thresholds are. But in this case, it's more than 1% of the Canadian population. This is another example of an Alberta and Saskatchewan trigger. This is, of course, the swift fox. Um, glo glo <coughs> pardon me. Globally vulnerable and Kosiwik threatened, and it was extirpated from Canada, I believe, in the 1920s, but was has been quite successfully reintroduced. Um, this is another obvious national trigger that will be important for, in particular, for sort of southeast Alberta and potentially uh, Saskatchewan as well, I think. Um, this is an example of an actual site that we're working on. So uh, this basically started out as being a single, I was kind of feeling daunted actually about the, the massive species list at Waterton, which I'll get into as the next example site. But so I looked into working on this one as basically intended to be a single species KBA, but as so often happens with these KBAs, it basically started to branch outward from there with more expert input and people suggested other species and other other areas and, and how the boundary should be refined and so on, which is, you know, crucial for the process and a bit one of the major things that we're looking for assistance with. But yeah, so it was originally proposed for a single species, the Kosiwik moss porcelain brium. Um, and this single site contains 65% of the Canadian population of this species, this globally rare moss species. And um, at this point, we're pursuing it as a national key biodiversity area, mostly for this species. It probably should be a global key biodiversity area because there's 65% of the Canadian population here, which easily, easily exceeds the 1% threshold, of course. Um, but Canada also has almost more than any other country in the world um, in, in terms of population size of this species as well, but we just don't have a good handle on the global population estimate. So it's could be kind of challenging to make the argument that it's a global uh, KBA, a KBA at this time. 
And then there's also a bat hibernaculum here, which will enter into it as well, and a variety of a few, a scattering of other rare species as well, but mostly just the porcelain's prime. And uh, this is an example of, this is what it looks like. It has this extremely specific habitat requirement. It only grows on limestone rock faces in the mountains, and it requires constant uh, seeping or trickling moisture. And uh, so this is an example of actually a new population uh, from the Kananaskis area this last year. And you can see that the population that's circled in red here, you can see that it's coming from this massive snowpack above, and it depends on having that snowpack be there constantly. So it's this species is severely threatened by climate change, and it'll be kind of interesting and potentially sad to see what happens over the next few decades. But um, yeah, so that'll play into both Whitehorse Wildland and potentially the Kananaskis area as well. And this is the other major KVA that I'm working on at the moment, at least that's sort of in progress. Um, this is, of course, the Castle Waterton Corridor, which originally started as being a KBA just designated for the Bollander's Quillwort, um, which is known from a few lakes in, in Waterton. And, uh, but then it just became clear that the number of, of uh, KBA trigger species here is so huge and includes a lot of similarity in the flora between the, the Waterton and, and the actual castle wilderness that it's um, basically I've moved forward with proposing it as being just the, that entire region as a KBA because we have it's it it occurs of course at this unique point where the Alberta, British Columbia, and United States uh, flora and fauna sort of meet down in that corner and there's a lot of a, a ton of diversity partly because of that, and this has the highest number of trigger species of any single key biodiversity area that's in Alberta or Saskatchewan that's known at this time. There's tw at least 23 non-bird trigger species, including at least two of those that aren't found anywhere else in Canada. And there could be more trigger species because Verena recently did, Sabrina Crisfield recently did a, a scoping analysis for B1 species, and she flagged a couple of other species that we should also consider that might be sort of not rare per se, but geographically restricted and with a hopefully uh, enough of the population in this area that we can at least investigate them as being B1 triggers as well. Um, and I guess I'll just mention here that species, if they're B triggers, they don't need to be rare species. If they're A triggers, they do. But if they're just geographically restricted, that can apply to any species. And uh, But the thresholds are a lot higher because we typically have like a 1% or a half percent of the national population for rare species, but for B species, B trigger species, it's like a, it's 10%. So that's can be a lot harder to demonstrate. So, but yeah, so there's that. And then there's a, a, even just a couple of days ago, another expert reached out to me and suggested another five trigger species that might be, or potential species that might be trigger species in that area that we don't have on our list either. So it's just extremely diverse. Um, this is an example of one of those trigger species. This is a Jones columbine. It's a super, it's a globally vulnerable, tiny little alpine columbine species that is probably going to be, could be uh, geographically restricted as well because it um, only occurs from Alberta and Montana, this tiny little, if you look at it on the map on the flora, the flora distribution map is this tiny little area of Alberta and Montana. But in Canada, the entirety of the Canadian population is within Waterton Lakes National Park. So that's definitely a species. This is a sort of a tentative map of areas that we're working on right now to, to varying <laughs> to varying degrees, but there's, yeah, we can, yeah, there's this whole south, southeast corner of Alberta, southwest corner of Saskatchewan, of course, and then there's Waterton Castle and uh, just a variety of places that are in, in varying degrees of work. And then Verena Crisfield is working on Athabasca sand dunes up there, for example. And then this is the main thing, opportunities for input. This is basically what we're looking for help with, which is, I mentioned that at least five of those species from Waterton have, um, like we don't, we didn't even have on our list. They were suggested by an expert that they could be worth looking into, and that was really important. And that level of expert input is just really, really valuable, both for the delineation of sites, where exactly should the boundary fall, uh, which species should be included, and so on. So that's that's definitely a major a major thing that we're looking for is that expert input, as well as potentially data sources that we haven't thought of, because um, we can only proceed with 
pursuing these species in this in this capacity if we have data that demonstrate that they're there recently and that we can demonstrate that there's enough of the population and so on. So that's also really crucial. Uh, I think that's most what I have. Yeah, just two more, two more trigger species. These are both uh, Waterton Castle trigger species here. So. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, more plants and lichens. Super, thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we'll, uh, we'll make your, Michael's email is also available uh, to see on our website too, with along with the other coordinators. So uh, if you'd like to reach out, um, do do reach out to him directly there um, or send us an email at, through our KBA Canada um, contact form as well on our website. Um, next uh, is uh, Dr. Lucy Poli, who is our Ecosystem Coordinator, Key Biodiversity Area Ecosystem Criteria Coordinator at WCS Canada. Uh, Lucy, I will share my screen for you and let me know um, when I should change the slides. Can everyone see that? Thank you. I can see it, so hopefully Perfect. everyone else can. Thank you, Peter. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to see so much interest. So one of the excellent things about the KBA initiative is that it recognizes that individual species are not the only important elements of biodiversity and that entire ecosystems are valuable as well. But of course, uh, ecosystems can be a little more challenging to define in a set way compared to a species. So within the KBA standard, there is a definition of what an ecosystem is, and that's what we follow as we apply these criteria to ecosystems. So that definition states that uh, an ecosystem type is a defined ecosystem unit for standard and repeatable assessment. It should be classified at an intermediate level in a globally consistent ecosystem hierarchy. So classification is not uh, country or region specific, it's globally consistent. And these ecosystem types should be defined by variables related to characteristic native species the abiotic environment they live in and the interactions within and between the native species and the abiotic environment. So just keep that in mind as I discuss ecosystems that we're operating under this definition here. Next slide, please. And one more. So there are three criteria in the KBA standard that cover ecosystems specifically. The first is criterion A2, which deals with threatened ecosystem types. So the definition of this criterion is that A2 KBAs will hold a significant proportion of the global or national, if you're going under the national standard, extent of a threatened ecosystem type. So to get to that, you must first assess the ecosystem type under the IUCN Red List of Ecosystems, which is similar to the Red List of Species, in that it sets out a series of criteria that ecosystems are assessed against. And if they meet criteria, they are given a threat level. So to be an A2 ecosystem type, they must be assessed globally as either critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable under the red list of ecosystems. And then to define an A2 site, oh, sorry, one more back. Thank you. Uh, the site needs to hold a one or more of the following, has to have at least 5% of the global or national extent of a ecosystem if it's critically endangered or endangered and at least 10% of the global or national extent if that ecosystem is a vulnerable type. The next criterion that deals with ecosystems is B4, which is geographically restricted ecosystem types. So for these KBAs, a site will hold a significant proportion of the global or national extent of a geographically restricted ecosystem. So essentially a rare ecosystem that doesn't occur very many places globally or nationally. Uh, so these ecosystems don't have to be assessed against the red list of ecosystems, but a site has to have more of that ecosystem type within it. So at least 20% of the global or national extent of that ecosystem type. And then finally, we have criterion C, which is a little bit different again. This criterion deals with the concept of ecological integrity, which is, <laughs> depending on how you define it, can be somewhat of a broad concept, but uh, in the context of KBAs, we're looking for sites that hold intact ecological communities with supporting large-scale ecological processes. So both uh, 
intact in terms of the species that you would expect to find there and very little to no native species as well as the native ecological processes that would normally be operating in that ecosystem. Uh, these are measured with respect to biotic integrity, such as species composition, abundance, ecological function, structure, and composition, as well as having very low levels of direct industrial human impact. For Criterion C sites, we're going by ecoregion rather than just ecosystem, and we look for two or fewer sites in each ecoregion, and these should be pretty big. We're looking for at least 10,000 square kilometers and sometimes bigger. So these are large intact sites that we're looking for. Next slide, please. So uh, if you're lucky to be in Alberta, because that's one of the places we've actually made some of the most progress with the ecosystem criteria so far. So this map here, I, I labeled Calgary to give you a little bit of context. We're kind of looking at uh, the southeastern quadrant of Alberta here. Um, this shows the potential ecosystem prairie sites for grassland ecosystems in Alberta that we've scoped out so far. So one more there, Peter, please. Um, so ecosystems in the prairies have been classified and mapped um, by NatureServe in the U US uh, previous to me coming on. And so we've had these potential sites identified for two ecosystem types in Alberta. So we've got in the blue there, the ecosystem classification is the Northern Great Plains dry mixed grass prairie. And then in the yellow further north, we have the Northern Great Plains fescue mixed grass prairie. So for the fescue mixed grass prairie, this uh, ecosystem was assessed as an endangered ecosystem type globally. And to make a site, you need at least 1,000 kilometers squared of ecosystem within a site, which would represent about 5% of the global distribution of this ecosystem type. So you can see that uh, we've got six sites, mostly or a little bit within Alberta, for this potential for this ecosystem type. And then for the dry mixed grass prairie, was also assessed as an endangered ecosystem type. Uh, at least about 1,900 square kilometers would represent 5% of the national distribution. So we're looking for national KBAs with this one. And there are three that are mostly within Alberta and then one that just has a little bit of dry mixed grass prairie within Alberta. So 10 potential ecosystem sites for prairie grasslands in total. And one more there, Peter, please. So as Michael is doing, our next steps are to get expert feedback on these sites so we can refine the boundaries, make sure that we didn't miss anything, um, ensure the condition of the ecosystem within these sites is what we think it is and that's not too degraded. And uh, so if you want to contact me with some knowledge, my email is there and maybe Peter can stick it in the chat too. And am I running out of time? Is that why you popped up? Okay, I'll go very quick. So Criterion C, as I said, is looking for large intact sites. You can just put them all up, Peter. Um, Alberta has a lot of industrial human impact on most of the landscape, so it's been tricky to find 10,000 square kilometer sites that uh, meet the Criterion C in Alberta. But we have done a national level scoping analysis where we've removed low integrity regions from a uh, criterion C potential areas. And this is what we've been left with with Alberta. So the uh, gray lines represent the ecoregions and then the colorful blobs are potential sites within those ecoregions. So you can see it's mostly up in the north there. We've got a little bit of potential criterion C as well as a little bit in the northern Rockies conifer forest kind of north of Jasper in that region. So this work is not as far along as the A2 and B4 criteria are in Alberta, but we've still got a lot of assessing to do to figure out if these sites will be KBAs as well. And that's it for me. So like I said, if you uh, have ecosystem knowledge to share, please get in touch. I'll be running workshops on refining those grassland ecosystems in early March. So please send me an email or drop a note in the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um... It was a great, great introduction to the ecosystem criteria in Alberta. Um, just as a, a note, you'll you might notice we're running a little bit over time. Uh, don't worry, we'll still have plenty of time for our last speaker, uh, Kelsey Norton, um, and we'll still have a lot of time for questions. We'll also be sticking around for an extra half hour um, after the the upcoming hour um, to answer more questions and and discuss more about the KBAs in in Alberta.
But for now, I'll uh, turn it over to our uh, final speaker for today, uh, Kelsey Norton from the Beaver Hills Biosphere Reserve region. Uh, Biosphere region, sorry. And then Peter, are you able to bring up my presentation? Great. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Kelsey Norton. I coordinate outreach for the Beaver Hills Biosphere. So yeah, I just wanted to give a quick overview on how our organization has kind of started to uh, go over this initiative and some of the key elements that have been kind of supporting our ways uh, for the application. And next slide, please. So just a quick um, um, uh, land acknowledgement. So the Weaver Hills Biosphere is located within Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous nations, including the Plains, Cree, Métis, Blackfoot, Plains Ojibwe, and Seal people. We have a deep relationships with the land, and so do all of these people, and they remain the original stewards of the Beaver Hills area since time immemorial. These lands are now home to Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples from many nations, and we continue to learn from our relationships with these nations by living out our responsibilities to them and enriching our vibrant communities together. But we do acknowledge that uh, an acknowledgement doesn't equal action, but we do have uh, some actions we've laid out, but I won't cover those obviously right now. Uh, next slide, please. So the Beaver Hills Biosphere is located just east of Edmonton there, about 20 minutes. And it's a distinct landscape indeed. I'm not gonna go over all the points here. I'll kind of be wary of time, but <laughs> it is a morainal landscape, which means it's leftover soil and rock from a moving glacier. Uh, the remnants uh, created a rolling landscape and a distinctive knob and kettle or a hummocky terrain, allowing for the establishment of various types of wetlands and shallow lakes, which actually cover around over 35% of the region, uh, making it kind of a good key <laughs> biodiversity probably complimentary. Uh, next slide, please. Oh yeah, and then that's a, just a zoomed in picture so you can see kind of the, how close it is to the city of Edmonton, almost home to over a million people there. So quite uh, close to that industrial and productive landscape. And next slide, please. So the origins of the biosphere are uh, definitely an interesting one. So uh, within the area, there's Miquelon Lake Provincial Park, Cooking Lake Blackfoot Re Recreational Area, and of uh, international significance is Elk Island National Park, which actually holds the largest remnant and the critically endangered Aspen Parkland region. So there was uh, kind of that catalyst of seeing, uh, being so close to Edmonton, seeing the surrounding areas having cumulative impacts. Um, and so the was a need to kind of work collaboratively to kind of have sustainable development. So a bunch of proactive relationships established the Beaver Hills Biosphere in 2002. And next slide, please. So the new chapter uh, after years of successful uh, projects and goals were completed led to uh, the region uh, having a UNESCO biosphere status in March, 2016. So not only is this area recognized locally, but nationally and globally. So there's a world network of biospheres. Uh, there's a Canadian Biosphere Res Reserve Association and our sister bi uh, biosphere down in Waterton. So it sounds like they're already <laughs> going to be in, uh, very heavily involved in the KBA initiative. So we're kind of that connector and facilitator on various initiatives. And next slide, please. So uh, just like many other areas and um, kind of highlighted, so Alberta and the Beaver Hills, for example, have uh, various threats um, and they all have cumulative impacts. So some of them are, you know, ultimately kind of interconnected, but and it's hard to kind of face one issue at a time. But we believe that the KBA initiative would kind of help on a few of these key elements here. And next slide, please. So I used to actually be involved with kind of the IBAs in Alberta. So that's kind of that pathway into turning IBAs into the KBA. So there's 47 throughout Alberta from yeah, down south all the way up to northern Alberta. So kind of the more known ones would be Frank Lake uh, near Calgary and Big Lake. That's just uh, kind of, I guess you can kind of see on the screen. There is the AB068. And in the biosphere, we're lucky to have two IBAs. Uh, there's Miquelon Lake, which is actually surrounded, majority of it is actually a provincial park, but we also have Monistic, Joseph, and Oliver Lakes, uh, which actually are a little bit data deficient, but 
are really well known for their congregations of different types of avian species, but it's kind of interesting to find out uh, kind of the more biodiversity aspect and kind of the holistic and to broaden, I guess, the borders of a lot of them. And next slide, please. So how are we kind of supporting the KBA initiative so far uh, with our conservation planning, which has kind of <clears throat> been able to support our conservation strategy? So we have an online map viewer, um, and that's kind of led towards the supporting <clears throat> a lot of moving parts. It's definitely a great tool that not only we are allowed to kind of utilize, but our partners as well. Um, has definitely lots of different layers. We've been able to kind of support it with some rare species as well as we kind of get some partner data. Uh, it's ideal for land use planning and it'll be kind of a good holder for a lot of this information that we're looking forward to with the KBA initiative. And next slide, please. And another huge supporter would be our science committee. So they kind of identify, evaluate, and support applied research within the biosphere and also have that kind of holistic view. So not just looking at environmental initiatives, but also social, economic, and cultural. And they're very supportive of this initiative so far. So they've been able to support with data and eventually kind of uh, will be helping us with the KBA application as well. And next slide, please. And one thing uh, I've been really tackling right now is our species list. So instead of uh, kind of just having those rare or at risk species, we're also looking to include common ones. So kind of definitely having that uh, bigger, broader view to promote citizen science and kind of get people out in the region and obviously elevates outreach. Um, yeah, and I think it, it will be a good supporter of monitoring changes over time. So obviously how climate change might impact uh, various certain issues in the biosphere. And yeah, obviously a great tool for stewardship and community groups to kind of get out and involve. So yeah, those are some of the key elements that will be supporting our uh, application for it to be a KBA. And yeah, we'll be looking at uh, kind of different boundaries and what that might look like because there's you know different biodiversity throughout the biosphere. But yeah, um, that's all for me. Oh, one more slide, sorry. <laughs> and yeah, this is kind of our little logo here. But if obviously I do the outreach, and if you don't follow us yet on social media, I highly recommend you do. <laughs> Awesome, and thank you. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, that was a great presentation, and uh, I can say as well, it's been so exciting learning more about the Biosphere, uh, Beaver Hill Biosphere region, and uh, and right, having you uh, as part of the KBA process um, in that area. Thank you. Appreciate that, Peter. I'll uh, I'll invite all the speakers to to come back on, um, and uh, at this point, I will. I see there's a active discussions going on in the chat already, so that's awesome. I'm going to allow everybody to unmute themselves and um, and turn on their video if they'd like. Um, and so please just uh, raise your hand if you have if you have a question you'd like to ask in person. Um, otherwise, we'll start from uh, from the top. Um, so. Going up, I think this question was addressed already, but um, about the boundaries of the Waterton. Um, sorry. Oh, I, Peter, think been, I, I think it's been I, adequately addressed. I asked that question. Perfect. Yeah, okay. it, was, it was just more, I say, when we, a lot of time when we see these boundaries, they stop at the jurisdictional boundaries rather than at more ecological boundaries. So that's something I'm sure a lot of us may be interested in chatting about in terms of how those final boundaries are distributed. And it it ties into Justin's further question about there, there not being as much species at risk data on that private land, um, but there are things that already exist like boundaries for the Waterton sort of park UNESCO biosphere reserve that have been designated that, that blend a bit into the private land base um, to show that there is a lot of interaction outside of the, the boundary where the park stops. It's, it's similar to the um, work that Lucy did on the prairie stuff. Often the studies end at uh, regional boundaries. And so they clip, they clip the data set and then that interface between these natural subregions and critical areas gets missed because the data sets have just said we're going to clip to prairie, we're going to clip to mountain, and the interface between them for certain species, which is critical, gets completely missed. And that, that's a, there's a long history of that in our Alberta mapping of important ecological areas or species. Yeah, uh, that's fair. As I kind of, you know, as I mentioned in the chat, it, at least as far as the records that we have, um, it does have 
fairly good correspondence with the actual park boundaries but as you say there you know there is a lot of uh, incentives to actually do surveys within parks or there's that that distinction between public and private lands which can definitely bias surveys more toward in parks within parks that's that's true um as far as the actual like we we definitely are interested in having as many people weigh in on the boundaries as we can um how, however we do tend to follow where the where the records are um but we're definitely we're definitely interested in having input on on the boundaries of this site I, and, and many that others. To, I guess that leads to my question that I put in the chat with respect to following where the records are. And I think when I've looked at Southern Ontario, Atlantic Canada, areas of BC, our experience in Alberta is that there you know we bump into SAR species and, and habitat all the time on private lands, and there are no mm -hmm. records. We you know you look at the distribution of limber and <clears throat> limber and whitebark pine, for example, we don't have mm -hmm. a good distribution map of, of this endangered species, federally endangered species, yet we know it it covers sort of you know, both public and private land. So it's just an interesting challenge for us here in Alberta, where there's other jurisdictions because of either scale or population or government policy have had much more work done to identify the what you would use as the foundation to develop your KBAs. And, and Justin brings up a, a good species in terms of limber pine. There's quite a lot of work going on in the private land in terms of limber pine sort of restoration and, and areas for sort of some limber pine orchards that could be included as part of that to to expand the boundary, which would you know still fit the criteria of an endangered species without just expanding it for the sake of it. Yeah, and indeed, limber pine is one of our trigger species, as is white bark pine. So definitely, we can. Uh, yeah, that would that would definitely be a pretty good excuse to to expand the boundary to the east, for example. Peter, can I jump in and just uh, add yeah. a little bit from an, another question that just popped up? So the last question that popped up from Mark Lysang was, uh, from my read of KBA criteria, it looks like a snapshot in time. Um, for example, the SAR current, currently present, so records that are or we currently have access to, and our habitat potential is captured in the greater ecosystem criteria only. And so it, that links to what you're saying that we we can only identify key biodiversity areas with the data that is available to us um, right now. And so we're supposed to use the best available data. Uh, and we are aware across Canada that we have, you know, not great data and it's better in some places and better for other, uh, worse for other places, better for some taxonomic groups, terrible for other taxonomic groups. One of the things that we hope to draw attention to is where those gaps are. And so there's, um, you know, we're, we're gathering lists of species for which the survey effort has not been sufficient, but should there should be KBAs based on people's advice and people sort of telling us that there should be a KBA here. But if we don't, the, the one of the thing that makes this tool very robust is also what prevents us from identifying key biodiversity areas when there's not sufficient data. The the um, the burden of evidence is quite high to be able to submit a nomination form. They have to be absolutely certain that this is a key biodiversity area right now with recent data. Um, so no, we're not looking at um, habitat potentials into the future. Oh, I, I did notice another question that I can also answer too. Uh, how often are KBAs reviewed? Uh, they're supposed to be reviewed every 10 to 12 years. And that's supposed to also uh, accommodate the the very true reality that global change is occurring at a at a very rapid pace and so um, we're not looking at where kbas should be in 10 years based on climate change projections or habitat potentials we're looking at where they are right now so management can occur and stewardship can occur right now and then we will continue to update them every decade or so as things change but of course in the meantime if new data becomes available or new information becomes available we can adjust a KBA at any time that information just has to come to us. So again, we rely if there are data sets that we don't have access to um, and but they are available, we would like to know about them. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'll just add on as well that how important the expert knowledge is as well. Um, we might not have data from outside, just outside protected areas or on private areas, but um, if experts know that something is there, then that's often a good enough reason for us to extend the boundary in that case too. So the importance of, uh, of reaching out to experts in our work uh, is, is highlighted by, by that question. But thank you both.
Um, Kira, I might uh, ask you to, to address this one as well um, from Kim Pearson at Waterton Lakes National Park. Could the presenters share any examples of how KBAs have fed into conservation or planning decisions in Canada or elsewhere? Great question. And of course, most of those impacts are yet to come because we're just really at the beginning of this process to identify all these areas. And while the draft sites, we have 250 so far, that, that's a lot, uh, plus all the important bird and biodiversity areas, we have a very long review process um, that, uh, that where we reach out to technical experts and then also to stakeholders and rights holders to make sure that everyone's aware of these sites and can contribute information before we make them public. So we don't want to spring these on anyone. Um, but in the meantime, there is huge demand for this, the for the data, for the spatial files, for the output, and they are already being used in draft form, um, where we and we have a lot of caveats in place, uh, and we're really limiting it to very few people, mostly governments, where they're saying, can we just have an idea of where this is happening? Because we're making decisions right now of, uh, related to protected area planning and land use planning. Um, so Environment and Climate Change Canada is extremely interested in. Um, knowing where key biodiversity areas are. I can't sort of speak too much to what the decisions they're making are now, but they're but key biodiversity areas are a high priority for them for protected area um, development, acquisitions, etc., and working with provinces and territories to make sure that we're focusing on areas that are really important for biodiversity. Of course, they're using other criteria as well. Um, Nature Conservancy of Canada in some places uh, there's one particular place in, in Quebec where they're supporting some of the work we're doing in Quebec. Um, they, But nationally, they want to incorporate key biodiversity areas into conservation prioritization, again, for land acquisition. Um, the British Columbia government is also supporting this work um, both with with funding and with a lot of participation um, and their land use planning departments in particular are making use of the existing important bird and biodiversity area so those are the bird kbas now and the other kbas to um, influence their land use plans in really particular regions and they hope to expand that to the province um, as well um, there have been a number there's well two to date first nations who are developing important uh sorry um uh, IPCAs, um, so Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, and wondering if there are KBAs on that in those areas that could support their um, proposals. And so we have, we're in, we're, when people come to us, we prioritize that. If there's any way we can help and support ongoing processes, we try to provide that information as soon as possible. Um, I mentioned sur survey work, and so there's been a couple of places where people have asked us for the list of KBA trigger species, knowing that these are of global significance um, and we don't have data, so that's feeding into their summer survey plans. Um, so that's not exactly conservation work, but it actually is, it's pretty fundamental to future conservation and uh, on the ground uh, stewardship of these particular species and sites. So those are a couple of examples. They're starting to grow. We're, we're, we're keeping track of, of where the information is being asked for, but we're really still at the beginning. Um, there's more of a legacy with the important bird and biodiversity areas where there are you know on the ground caretakers associated with many of the sites who work on the ground and they know that this is a site that's really important for a particular species of birds. They do monitoring of those species. They work with local authorities on management plans. They expand the sites. They sometimes um, advocate for protection where it's appropriate. It's not always appropriate, um, etc. So, so we can learn from the important bird and biodiversity area legacy and we'll continue to build on that um, in all the different ways that it's appropriate within each jurisdiction. Thank you, Kira. Uh, Justin, I see you have your hand up. Um, before you go, I just want to highlight that Amanda Beekle at Birds Canada, um, who is working on that reassessment of important bird and biodiversity areas to KBAs, uh, has just dropped a note in the chat. So if you're interested in learning more about those KBAs for birds that we're adding other elements of biodiversity to, um, I would check out her comments in the chat. Um, but Justin, please uh, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to start by saying that the, the work that you're doing, I think, is really important, and it's really uh, encouraging that this is happening. Um, for those of us that are are doing securement work on the ground, I, I guess sort of a contextual concern or anxiety that I have that I want to share with you. You probably heard this elsewhere, is and you, and you said this at the at the beginning that that the KBAs aren't trying to capture landscape 
conservation issues, ESG, connectivity, those sorts of uh, large scale landscape issues. The challenge that that I've seen during my time in conservation is that often governments or organizations will kind of fixate on certain landscape areas and funding and policies get linked to that. And it's convenient too, because often they're small. It's like a little dot here on the map. And so let's protect that little dot, right? Because it's easy and it doesn't interfere with other land uses and other industrial development and other things. So this is great. Let's fixate on these KBAs, solves our problem. So I, I guess you know all this, but I guess I'm just raising the anxiety that people do like to grab onto things like KBAs and then link dollars and policies to them because it's much easier than landscape scale conservation. And so that context is so critical because, uh, again, we've seen funding uh, in certain cases, you know, if you're in an IBA, bang, you can get funding right away. Well, good, that's good, it should be, but but all this other stuff that's really important gets missed because it's not as easier to to put on a map. And so, you know, that's, that's I guess, a, a, a comment from those of us on the ground doing pragmatic landscape scale conservation particularly on private land where we always have we already have the issue of limited data and we have policies that are concerned about uh interfering with existing land uses and that's also my question around jurisdictions too because so many of the data sets are clipped to crown land because people don't want to, to look at pub private land because it's messy and so all these things add up to data sets that funnel policy and dollars towards areas that are important but maybe not the most important in some cases so Probably all things you've heard already, but I think it's particularly acute in Alberta. I'd, I'd like to respond to that. I, I, first of all, thank you for your comment. I think it's incredibly important to raise that, even if we have heard it before. We we discuss this regularly enough, and we are very much concerned with the same kinds of issues. Um, just speaking from WCS Canada's perspective, we highly advocate all the time with a science basis for landscape scale conservation and believe in that fully. So what we hope to do with the key biodiversity area program is to fill in some of the gaps. So we have IBAs. We, a lot of uh, conservation approaches actually aren't capturing a lot of these weird, rare places that, you know, aren't, don't get a lot of conservation concern, uh, you know, lichens and weird molds and things like that and then cave anthropods. So, so we are adding those things to the map and then through the ecosystem criteria, we hope to capture larger landscapes as well. We aren't going to be able to capture everything. So in addition to working on the key biodiversity area um, initiative, which we do believe is going to fill in tons of gaps and help us you know, identify places of incredible value, we will continue to advocate for other approaches to through all the different types of work. But I understand the risk and I I'm sympathetic and, and even within our talks to government, we advocate for this as a tool among many. We don't have always full control on what happens with that afterwards, um, but we hope that, you know, but just by building up this information basis and providing a much broader set of information, capturing a, a wider variety of biodiversity elements, we're, we're adding good information to the pool and and then after that, we all need to to do the work of advocating for how that information is is used um, in policy and decisions at different scales of government. Um, but your point is very well taken. Thanks. Appreciate the answer. Thank you. Uh, I I just like to make a small note um, as we approach the end of the hour. We'll be sticking around for another half hour. Um, but if you have to go, no worries. You can catch the rest of the questions in the recording. Um, which will be sent out to everybody who's registered for the Eventbrite um, and anybody who contacts us um, at the through the KBA Canada website or elsewhere. Um, I'd also just, if you are able as well, I uh, just remind everyone of the survey so we can follow up with people um, afterwards if you're interested in participating more or following along with the process. So do fill that out before you leave if you have to go at the hour. Um, moving up to some of the other questions. Um, there was a great one from from Peg Strackham, uh, Strackman, sorry, uh, about whether we have a communication strategy to share this information with groups like municipalities whose decisions impact biodiversity. Um, and maybe I'll take the first uh, jab at this question and and just to say we are we're trying to build up our outreach uh, around around these key biodiversity areas. We have a, a couple. We have a newsletters, a webinar series, and others. Each of the KBAs goes through two. 
rounds of review, um, one with technical experts um, and another more general round where we're just trying to pass all of these key biodiversity areas and different sites that we're looking at by people around the key biodiversity areas and the sites. Um, and so they go out to, to interested groups, naturalist groups, uh, stakeholders, land trusts, uh, indigenous communities, First Nations, Métis nearby. Um, and so that's a big a big step of the process um, where we try to reach everybody like municipalities and others who might use uh, the, the outputs of those key biodiversity areas at a site level. Um, and then of course, at a broader level, uh, we are trying to reach out um, to, to municipalities, but it's uh, it's slow going. And as, as we build up the outputs of these key biodiversity areas, that will ramp up as well. Does anybody else want to uh, respond to that? We're good. Um, then I'll move on to another question. Michael, you addressed this in the chat, but uh, Dave was asking how important are CDCs uh, or ASIMs in Alberta to the KBA process? Um, and I see also in response to that before you uh, address that, Michael, Marge Major from the Alberta Conservation Information Management System, ASIMs, um, Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, just commented that ASIMs is the Alberta CDC associated with NatureServe Canada, who documents processes and maps data for elements in the conservation of conservation concern in Alberta. Um, but Michael, do you want to maybe just address for those who, who are watching the recording later and don't have access to the chat, uh, how important are the CDCs and the KBA process? Uh, yeah, I would say they're they're very important because a lot of, like I said, a lot of our data comes from the CDCs and um, in, in some cases, if there's uh, KBAs that are being designated for particularly sensitive species at risk, then it's, you know, we, we need to have a conversation with the CDCs about exactly what they're what they're comfortable with and that weighs into delineations or whether those species even end up on the KBA proposal. Maybe they're just too sensitive to even to even be featured there, for example. So, yeah, it's, it's the CDCs are essential. I don't think we could do anything that we do without them. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Brian, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Thanks. Uh, those of you who know me know that technology is not my strong suit, so I thought I'd throw something out there first. Um, just thinking out loud that seems like there's been lots of um, interest in, in KBAs, just given this introductory uh, workshop today, and thank you to those who coordinated it. And, and wondering about a level of interest from folks either currently on the call or others to kind of continue the conversation and and if either you know through you guys um, nationally or if it's something that we want to think about trying to figure out on a more provincial nature just to keep the dialogue going and not having to wait for some of these more technical aspects to be fulfilled rather relative to data acquisition for example so I'm just thinking out loud about, you know, kind of continuing the momentum and thoughts on that, either from yourselves um, or from participants generally. Um, I, I'd love to comment on that. And thank you so much for that suggestion, Brian. Uh, in, in certain regions of Canada, this kind of um, movement has been popping up in Saskatchewan, for example, um, led by Nature Saskatchewan. There's a group who are really keen to, oh, I have, sorry, I have, a, I have roofers at my house. I apologize for any banging. Um, but they're they're keen to provide advice and we need advice. I mean, we have, we're doing the technical work and that's where we have expertise. Um, and we have, you know, contacts within you know, the CDCs who provide advice and, and with different organizations. And this and it's, it's key to, it's not just about getting access to data and interpreting the data but it's also knowing who we should be talking to, who we've left out, how we can better accommodate or be relevant to different people on the ground and different stakeholders, and how do we provide data in a way that's relevant, who should we be reaching out to to review our products, etc. Um, so we're really keen to, to make our this initiative impactful, and I think the way to go about it is to, to, to do what you've just suggested is to maybe start thinking about, and we are thinking about it at the national scale with national stakeholders, but I think 
it's often at the provincial and territorial scale where decisions are made of this nature and where advocacy has to happen. And that's beyond the scope of our work, but what, where we can support, um, you know, these kinds of discussions and, and provide information, in, uh, data, uh, materials, uh, we very much would be happy to do that. So just kind of a follow up, um, Kelsey mentioned that we're looking to test this kind of a pilot area known as the Beaver Hills Biosphere, but if there's interest at a provincial scale to continue these conversations, then maybe either through the survey or through people sending a note to yourselves to indicate some level of interest to continue the conversation and then we can think about how to at least coordinate that online initially given the current pandemic restrictions that we have and, and start to think about you know, where to from here and what I think some of the points that Justin brought up and others you know about not only just the technical data but the application and how it can assist organizations who are involved in conservation and stewardship in the province doing their work and help to address any policy concerns at a provincial or at a municipal level um, maybe there's a way that we can start to think about those pieces uh, that are complementary to the data, the technical side. I think that's a terrific idea. Does anyone else want to want to chime in? Great. Well, we'll uh, we'll make sure to follow up with that then. Um, really fantastic to continue these discussions at lower than the national level um, where it's where it's often more relevant like was mentioned um, excuse me this is Lee foot I, I guess I'd like to chime in uh, as a long-term resident of Alberta previously I've seen lots of iterations of of various uh, initiatives like this whether it's a crew or the Canadian Mount Mountain Network or ABMI or the Ducks Unlimited Assimilation as much as possible, it'd be really nice not to try to reinvent the wheel and to draw as much information from those that's relevant and save the budget for the new reach into new special areas that are top priority. And maybe as well, a meta analysis that would learn from the mistakes of others. Um, there's just so much information out there. It's an information management problem in many ways. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that that's uh, very true. Uh, we are trying to build on everyone who came before uh, all the information that has been developed. Uh, some of those initiatives are very relevant, for example, to the ecosystem criteria work. Um, so, so point again, very well taken. Sorry for the banging again. Um, and 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 we and so if there is particular advice, um, we'd very much like to hear it. But otherwise, we will continue to reach out and ask for advice on all of the initiatives that we're we're doing. The idea behind being as open as possible and as participatory is we do a little bit rely on people reaching out to us because we have a pretty small team at the national scale um, and we're, we're going to miss people. We don't have enough expertise in all the jurisdictions. So we hope that people will, will step up and, and um, let us know if we're, if we're making mistakes or if we're if we're going sort of over the same ground that others have have tread before. Uh, we have some very good um, advisors at the national level, but again, they don't know everything. But they have been uh, around for a very long time, involved in many of the processes that you that you've mentioned. And so they meet. We meet once a month, and we we let them know what our progress is, and they provide advice. Um, and so they're involved in a lot of different big conservation organizations at the national scale, but we could continue. We continue to need additional advice as well. So thank, thank you for that. Justin, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I just know I, I agree to some degree um, with Lee's comments that we need to build on existing data sets, but I do have concern that if you just build on existing data sets and go looking for new things, this is my whole challenge that, that, that has frustrated me with data sets is that each group has a specific objective and they look at certain data sets and they clip those data sets. And so we have a lot of data sets in Alberta to me that that miss all sorts of things where they say they've studied a certain region, but they've gone in, as we all know, with certain assumptions around data and that's impacted the what's come out of it. So I, I'm not comfortable saying, let's just take what's there and then look for new things. I think we need to look 
again at these key areas in Alberta um, based on, on, on new data, new understanding, and, and not just go looking for new things in new areas. But I'm not saying don't don't use those data sets or, or understand them. I'm just saying, frankly, a lot of them are flawed. Not flawed, but, but yeah. for this process, they may not be relevant because they were for a very specific objective. Yeah, J Justin, that, that's fair. Fair. Some of them are related to hunting or strict preservation or, or commercial or agriculture. But the concept of triangulation, where you take various data sets and look at the intersection points, um, I think still has value. And every initiative that comes along is wants to be the new end result and the, the newest thing. And unfortunately, there is a tremendous amount of redundancy. I'm just my plea is to reduce the redundancy, save your budgets as much as possible and um, and learn from the mistakes of the others. I mean, if, if their data collection is truly flawed, then that's somewhere you don't want to go. And uh, that that's valuable information. But I, I take I take your point, though. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I would just I, add one thing, which sorry. is that we our, our goal is to identify all key biodiversity areas in Canada. We're agnostic of where they're falling. Uh, so we are building on the understanding of where these sites should be and getting input. And so it'll, it gives us shortcuts to the low hanging fruit out there. Um, but we do want to know where they all are to be able to sort of analyze also, well, how how well are we managing biodiversity, at least using this indicator? It is an indicator. Key biodiversity areas are being put forward at the global scale with the new sort of biodiversity frameworks as a pretty important metric for understanding how well countries are doing in terms of protecting biodiversity or biodiversity with different approaches and managing biodiversity. So so we do hope to have a full um, you know, array of these sites wherever they are. And of course, that will be limited by our data and access to data and understanding of the sites. So just wanted to mention that we we will get them all eventually. It's it'll but it will be you know slow slow to get there. Uh, I just saw related to this, um, Carolyn Campbell uh, has dropped a question in the chat just to thank Lee for uh, for his comment um, and wondering about the uptake in actual approval processes. Uh, one opportunity might be to ensure that it is embedded within Alberta's DRAS system. Uh, so perhaps that could be included in a follow up. I'm not sure what the DRAS is, but. Uh, Carolyn, yeah, it's, it, it's Carolyn. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and thanks to WCS Canada. Um, I, I really appreciate the rigor that you're approaching this. And as you say, as an available information set for current processes, you know, it's all good. But kind of like Lee, um, you know, there have been, um, you know, say provincial environmentally significant areas or aquatic uh, significant areas or protective notations. And when it comes to approvals, um, doesn't really make too much difference unless there's local stewards like like the Beaver Hills Biosphere Initiative. Great, you know some of some of Salt's work. Great. Anyway, the reason I posted a little bit cryptic in that um, message is you know one opportunity is Alberta is uh, okay. This is my editorial. I think it's mainly under the guise of streamlining, uh, but is. Um, um, saying is pledging to include a bunch of important ecological data layers in a digital regulatory assurance system that will help both proponents uh, and public as well, of course, as 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 the approvals writers in government or the the reviewers in government to identify, um, you know, supposedly all the important vital information on the ground when there's a, um, a proposal. And there's going to be way more emphasis on providing upfront information and way less emphasis, apparently, on reviewing applications. So I think to hold them to the, you know, to hold the good intentions of having really um, great data layers up front uh, for both proponents, regulators, the public to see and be guided by, that might be a really useful way you know, like Brian Ilnicki Il said, for future conversations to try to insert. It, it still isn't the same as regulatory enforceable limits or, or commitments, but it might be a good information layer. So it just, that just comes to mind. And thanks everyone for their good conservation work.
Thanks, Caroline. Yeah, that's that sounds really worthwhile. Agreed. Thank you. Um, feel free to if anybody has other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or uh, raise your hand um, or just unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Um, I just want to address so uh, Margot Harivio and uh, Heather Lazaruk have, have noted that the Peace River Parkland natural subregion in, in northwestern Alberta um, is a very uh, interesting spot. Wondering if it's on anybody's radar. There are a few intact parcels remaining and they contain a unique mix of distinct parkland species as well as boreal and mountain. Um, they're uh, important and distinct ecosystems unique to Alberta. Um, and also wondering about the unique nature of Alberta's foothills that doesn't really exist anywhere else in Canada. Lucy, I saw you address this in the chat, but wondering if you want to um, speak a little bit to this uh, as well. For sure, Gordon yeah, Michael. thanks. Thanks for those excellent suggestions. And I see Dave has also clarified Peace River Parkland is not within Central Parkland region. So thank you. Um, Right now, there are no ecosystem sites assessed for that area. We've stuck mainly to the extensive prairie grassland ecosystems that are shared with the United States. Um, I think one of the trickier parts of the ecosystems criteria is the level of classification at which the ecosystems have to occur at, which, as I mentioned in the presentation, needs to be within a globally consistent hierarchy and Sometimes this means that ecosystems, the classification that we need to apply them for key bays doesn't necessarily align with the various provincial level classifications that occur at the different provinces across Canada. So right now, um, like we're not looking at the subregion or the regional uh, natural at subregion level. Um, we're looking at more of a globally consistent level for ecosystem criteria. Uh, that being said, it's always very useful to have these kind of suggestions of important areas for ecosystems criteria. Um, this work is really just getting started and there's there's assessments to still be done across Canada. So I can certainly take note of these regions and these ecosystems as important and keep them in mind. But right now the the furthest along that we've gotten in the, the uh, ecosystem KBAs are in the grasslands, more south eastern parts of Alberta right now. Um, I did mention like there is some area that could be considered foothills within some of these ecosystems, the grassland ecosystems, but it sounds like Heather's uh, and Justin are referring more specifically to these these natural subregions where um, yeah, we're not assessing at that level at this moment, but I can certainly take note of these as important ecosystems and look at them as we move further along in the ecosystem criteria work. Yeah, it's like grasslands that are getting clipped out because they're not in the grassland mm -hmm. natural region. They're in the mountain, the Rocky Mountain, but they're actually, you know, grasslands. Um, so yeah. there's areas that are being ignored. Um, that makes and, sense. And, and, and to do with that, I guess I'm curious, has there been any element of this work that looks specifically at areas for biodiversity that will accommodate um, climate change adaptation. So these areas that are sort of these zones of transition, either elevation, precipitation. So, you know, in Alberta, because we've got the mountains, the foothills, the prairies, Cypress Hills, Porcupine Hills, we've, we've got these areas that we think are going to probably represent you know, migration of species over time due to change in precipitation and temperature and other factors. Is there a way to recognize those areas? And I know there's been, uh, what is the complex facet data? There's been, there's been a lot of work done to try and understand climate change adaptation based on uh, the, the nature of the, the current ecosystem, everything from geology to vegetation to those sorts of things. So I'll stop there, but I guess I'm asking, is there any incorporation of areas critical to biodiversity for climate change adaptation? I can answer that a little bit, although Lucy, probably within your criterion C, you may have a few comments too. Um, I wanted to mention two things. One is that the national 
key, key biodiversity area standard, um, the ecosystem criteria part is really undeveloped because we, we hadn't applied it, we hadn't tried to apply it yet. And so to be able to capture some of these provincially significant and unique ecosystems, we will likely be able to incorporate those into the national key biodiversity area standard. Um, but we need to be able, we need to have the time and the resources to be able to explore those fully and to understand how they differ across the different provinces to develop at least a standard that's consistent across the country. So there's lots of potential there still, but that's one of the most complex parts of our work, I'd say, because it requires new research um, and a lot of consultation with ecosystem experts. Um, the second part is that no key biodiversity areas can't really, there's no criteria that would allow us to to capture the, the zones of transition that you're talking about, but we but we are really interested in this question. We do have the possibility of some research um, being done at a university in Quebec that's looking at um, the, the impact of climate change across time on key biodiversity areas and the species within them. Um, that's not exactly what you're talking about, but it is important. If, if we did have access to that information uh, easily, we might be able to delineate sites that are at least a little bit more resilient to climate change. But we hope for the moment that while we do that research, which is a bit more academic in nature, um, we will continue to reassess sites and then it, it will be other tools that will likely capture those sites, except for in these Criterion C sites, which uh, Lucy, do you want to comment on the ability of the, those very large northern sites to take that into account? For sure, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, we're not supposed to look at places that could be affected by climate change to rule out KBA sites because that would probably be the whole world is potentially affected by climate change. But for sure, within the scope of the Criterion C sites, which are by nature going to be quite large, one of the really helpful distinguishing factors of is this area better than this other area will be refugee refugia potential for climate change. So areas that could act more as a refuge for species of climate change or where species are more likely to move due to climate change can be explicitly taken into account in those larger criterion sea sites. Um, so it's it's not something that, like Kira said, we're going to be able to do at the smaller sites at the species level or even some of the smaller ecosystem sites, but certainly uh, the larger sites that are covered under Criterion C, this is something that we are considering the refugia potential, and it will be a really useful data layer to find the best place to put, put these sites in the areas of the highest ecological integrity. Yeah, um, I think the refugia can... concept is an important one to incorporate for sure. Absolutely. Um, just go back to the discussion on these these grasslands and the, the natural subregions and um, yeah, we'll just make the comment that one of the trickier things about the ecosystems criteria is those thresholds that we have to meet within a site to have that much of that ecosystem um, of the global or national extent of that ecosystem to within a site to meet those KBA thresholds. So for yeah. areas, unfortunately, where we have sort of a patchy distribution of an ecosystem type within a matrix of another ecosystem type, like high elevation grasslands within the montane or the boreal or the footlands, it's a little bit harder to meet those thresholds. But as Kira mentioned, we may be able to do that within the national KBA criteria. But, but, but that's a really important comment because there is inherent virtue in those areas that have that high diversity of Aspen forest, grasslands, Douglas fir forest, limber pine, riparian areas all in one place. And that's what we ignore in a lot of data sets. We study the prairies, we study the mountains, but then you have these areas in Alberta where people like Craig and I spend, and others on the call spend a lot of our time. We know because there's a little bit of everything in one area that they're really valuable, but nobody, that it doesn't represent all of the grass or all of the forest, but it's inherently valuable because of the diversity. But, but, it's, but it happens to, take place mostly on private land in Alberta, this incredibly diverse area. So it's not studied. It's not anyway. It, I'm just I'm wanting to flag this because when you say it's not going to represent 90% of the grass or that ecosystem, it won't, but it's going to represent a little bit of everything, which we don't have anywhere else. So anyway, just another for sure. Comment. Yeah, it's something that, that we've we've been grass grappling with as well. And there's other mm -hmm. ecosystem types. There's a lot of wetlands that occur in a very patchy distribution that also make it challenging to meet these thresholds. So I hope as we move forward, we can make recommendations for global and national KBA thresholds and, and hopefully 
do the best we can to tackle that problem because it's it's something we're aware of for sure and appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, Lucy, it's Heather Lazaric here. I just wanted to um, th thank you for your comments and what I was thinking about and maybe others are thinking about with those smaller disjunct ecosystems like the Peace River Parkland or even the foothills or even the montane grasslands. I, I recognize that they probably wouldn't meet the ecosystem criteria, just the nature of the landscape kind of use levels on them alone might negate the, their ability to be KBAs as an ecosystem type. But you would think that within a land classification in Alberta, where you have smaller sets that are maybe disjunct from a main ecosystem type, that that would, might be a, a, a trigger for, for KBA folks to look at those um, as maybe um, for, the, for the other eco or for the other KBA criteria, like um, geographically, um, you know, disparate or, or whatever. I can't remember what the name of the criteria is, but um, for those kinds of criteria. So looking across the KBA, KBA criteria for those smaller ecosystem types, like especially with the Peace River Parkland, it's so totally distinct. Um, um, in terms of the species distributions and and the types of species that are that are there, um, I equate it to the Cypress Hills. In case that makes you excited at all, but um, you should be excited because even the the abiotic landscapes there are really distinct. But the same thing with the foothills and the montane. So the crossover um, would be an interesting thing to to take a look at and make sure we're examining that in Alberta. For sure, thanks, Heather. That's a great point, and I think something that Michael and I can both contemplate and use those unique regions as markers of likely places of unique species or restricted species as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody. I want to just want to get to one comment that was in the chat from uh, from Dave on the concept of consistent ecological classification systems. Um, and just a comment that the scale that implies will be difficult to reconcile with the provincial and territorial approaches to ecological classification, um, which are dis disparate across Canada for various reasons, topography, history, interpreter perspective. Um, so thank you for the comment, Dave. I can just quickly comment on that back that we are working within a couple of provinces in particular um, with so, for example, the government of Nova Scotia is really interested in doing this from a bottom up way and trying to figure out how and provide advice on how we might apply ecosystem criteria at the national scale. So they're mapping their ecosystem, particular ecosystems that probably could trigger a key biodiversity area, but are at a smaller scale working within the Canadian vegetation, uh, Canadian national vegetation vegetation classification they're part of that team and trying to figure out and pro provide advice on that they're also we're also doing that in bc um so slowly but surely we will develop expertise here and figure out how to make sure that we capture some of these places and i, I doubt we'll be able to capture everything that's important to, to everyone and that is the nature of individual tools but i think we can continue to improve on it for sure um particularly when it comes to those ecosystems um, Peter, can I comment on the very last question too? Just very, very yeah, quickly. Please do, okay. yeah. Just because they was asking a question about how we'll connect with the U.S. program on key biodiversity areas, especially for places like Waterton. Um, so the U.S. It has not, doesn't have a key biodiversity area program, but they are trying to get it up and running. And the good news is that it's being run and initiated by NatureServe in the U.S. Uh, we work with NatureServe quite a bit. We work with NatureServe Canada, who are one of the main partners in sort of the coordinating group of this project. Um, so we we are constantly in contact. We will kind of figure out where there are potential potentially transboundary key biodiversity areas, which is allowed. Uh, we will be working with them, but I but they're behind. So I think we're just going to be going ahead and continuing to focus on things within our boundaries and flagging places where we likely have to have. Uh, transboundary sites. Um, in some places it might be less politically fraught than others. Uh, it seems like there's a good history at Waterton. Uh, there's maybe more conflict or well, not conflict, but um, sort of potential for challenge around like the Alaska Yukon border with the porcupine caribou herd, which is a transboundary site, but that we've only had to, we've had to delineate for just Canada. So um, we do have lots of potential for working with our US partners. Thank you, Kira. Um, we're coming up on the end of our extra half hour, so uh, I'll turn it. I'll just remind everyone uh, if you haven't already, please do take uh, a couple seconds to just fill in the survey um, so that we can 
reach out to you and, and contact you after if you're interested in participating. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over now. I want to give a huge thank you to all of our speakers, um, Kira, Michael, Lucy, and, and Kelsey as well from Beaver Hills Biosphere Region. Um, does anyone have any final comments they want to close us out with? If not, then thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for the really terrific and insightful discussion. We're really, I think all of us are looking forward to, to following up with all of you afterwards. Um, so thank you for taking the time to join today. Uh, have a great day and hopefully enjoy a piece of nature and a potential KBA near you. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot.